This is the third part of our Vespa 101 series. In this part, we will deal with the Vespa small frame. So far, we have always had our expert Oli, but Oli has no clue about small frames. So, we drove across Germany to Eric, and why we went to Eric, we'll show you now. Now, we're inside Eric's house, and Eric is a happy man because there are also Vespas in his house, as you can see here. Let's go back to 1962. Piaggio has just launched the Vespa GS4, the Vespa GS160, the last round model, also technically very innovative. Eric, can you explain to me why Piaggio has also launched the Vespa small frame in the same year? I would even go further back a little. It's July 1960. Vespa's really successful. They've produced and sold a 2 millionth Vespa and are just thinking, how can I find new customers for my products? And so they came up with the Vespa small frame. Especially for young drivers. At that time in Italy, you're allowed to drive up to 1.5 HP without a driver's license from the age of 14. And I also wanted to specially address the ladies because, until then, the female Vespa driver was mostly only on the pillar and was not allowed to ride a Vespa herself. Okay. Very interesting. So, a scooter specifically for teenagers from 14 years of age and women, probably because of that lighter and smaller body. Now, let's change the location a bit to take a closer look at what makes a Vespa small frame, a Vespa small frame, and what the technical features are. Now, this is a small frame, a very typical small frame. And this is where Eric can explain best what this is all about. We're standing here in front of a Vespa 50N, one of the most produced Vespas. And the first thing you can see is that the small frame compared to the big frame has become smaller. It has become significantly more compact and the base compared to the big frame model shrank by almost half. Making the whole vehicle more compact and more maneuverable. Thanks to the steel construction on the scooter, it got a stronger connection. We also know from other models that we have removable engine cheeks and side panels, and on the small frame this has been integrated. The small frame is that quasi integrated. And you can see that the motor hatch is only there for quick revision on the scooter. It is fully integrated in the scooter, and that is what defines the Vespa small frame. So, you probably know that from the last videos. The steering head, the round one, the nose here, and the sheet metal actually look very similar to the one of the GS4 and the older models, like the VNB. Perhaps it's not that easy to distinguish for a layperson, but this is the feature to recognize a Vespa small frame the fastest. The side panel here, which is firmly attached to the scooter. Is there anything else to say about the engine or what's special about it? In the 1960s, with the first small frames, the engines also changed in their degree of inclination. We used to have horizontal cylinders and now switched to 45 degrees. With the first small frame models, we still have completely normal interrupted ignitions. And then, in the model's history, we also switched to the desired and easy K electric ignition. Okay. Another characteristic of the small frame is the attached sheet metal cascade, as you can see here. We already know that from the classic 50s and 60s models, during the 1970s at Vespa Spezial, we switched to the plastic cascade at the front, but we'll show you later. And what's also interesting with this new engine is that it simply needs way less space. So, a large frame, it's just wider here, but the small frame just has the small frame and the small engine that fits nicely in there. That's why everything had to be redesigned and they couldn't just continue to use the older, bigger engine. 
Exactly. In comparison, for example, with the directly aspirated models or with the big frames that we mentioned earlier, we almost go back one step. In the 1950s, at the lamp down, for example, the carburetor was also behind the carburetor cover. And here too, the carburetor has got its own place and is virtually connected to the engine, like it was before. It's sometimes pretty tight in there for big hands. That's probably why they called them small frame in reality. Because they knew that we would have problems screwing. Here is the standard carburetor, 1610, 1616 installed. Now, this scooter in front of us also has a very special story, am I right? Exactly. We're facing my personal holy grail in this collection. This is a Vespa Verde Mela in great original condition. What is special about it, it is the fourth ever Vespa produced from this model series and also in my absolute favorite color. Okay, so the first in this color that was ever made. This is the first to come off the production line in this color and the fourth ever produced Vespa 50N. Okay. Crazy. Let that sink in. Very nice scooter. But next we want to take a look at what different small frame models existed and which are the most important. And for that, we go back up to your garage. That's how we do it. We are back in Eric's sanctuary namely in the middle of his Vespa collection. And as you can see, Eric mainly collects Vespa small frame models, which fits pretty well to today's episode because the collection is really terrific. And I think it is also quite complete. And where we are now, this is exactly the point where the small frame story begins, right? I suppose. This is the first model built in 1964, in its original condition, with an original libretto and the original Italian papers. A special feature of the first series is the small engine hatch on the side, the large luggage compartment, the slightly smaller tank and the special sign on the handlebar, where the three gear molds is drawn a little bit differently than on other models. Okay. And why it's up there and not down here, I think there is a very simple reason for that. I have a slight impression that you have a fable for a certain color, Eric. Am I right? Yes, it's the dream in apple green. As you can see, the verde mela or apple green is my absolute favorite color. I've been on the hunt for according models for many years and almost have them all together. The only one I'm still missing, there's supposed to be a Vespa Rally in Apple Green in Sweden. But unfortunately, I haven't got my hands on it yet. And what is also not available in Apple Green is the first series. That's why it's up there. And how it went on with the Vespa small frame, we'll take a look at outside. Okay. Now we have set up the various Vespa models, chronologically, right? Correct. Let's start with an absolute classic, the 90 Super Sprint. It has a very special silhouette, but we certainly come back to that in detail later. Let's move on. For me, the first real 50 is the 50L. This one is also from 1966. A small feature is the square emblem that you won't see on the other models afterwards. Just like the lettering and the beaded edge in aluminum. And there are various different backlights on the model that make the model special. And these two, I think both, DSS and DL, they had a shorter frame, is that correct? That's right, yes. How much is it shorter, approximately? That's the speciality of the models. It's a few centimeters, you hardly notice it when you drive, but it's just special on this model. Okay. It then actually goes on like this. The most common 50, which was built. They differ in the N and R models. That is basically the Vespa that every child in Italy received for their communion, for birthday. This is the model that everyone had to have, that was built the most often. Hair also my favorite color, also in the beautiful original paint. And after that, the Vespa gets bigger, right? The Vespa has grown up. 
sind hier auch schon, wie du gerade gesagt hast, nicht mehr im And as you already said, we are no longer the 50cc range but are switching to the 125cc. The frames have become a bit larger overall. The wheelbase has lengthened. The special thing about driving is that we are no longer moving in the 8 and 9 inch range but are switching to the 10 inch tires for the first time. The whole piece is more comfortable while driving and ultimately we have two models. First one is the 125cc Primavera, the spring who came to the streets in English. Also, der Frühling zu Deutsch. With beautiful driving characteristics, a beautiful model. And I also think with the very elegant lettering and the great bearded edge, it's a real classic. When was the 125cc introduced first? This model here is from the production year 1969. Then the absolute driver model, Primavera ET3. I think it's a big step. Ich finde einen Quantensprung. Also the scooter that causes the least trouble in the small frame series. Where you can have the most fun with it. It is simply due to the fact that the electronic ignition was installed on this model for the first time. It starts great. Startet sich super. The gas has a bit more responsiveness. The fan has become a bit lighter. It's a really great model to drive. It's the classic daily driver. We can just drive to the ice cream parlor, but also the 100 km too with the boys is no problem with this scooter here. Okay, and that's exactly what ET3, Electronic Traversi 3, stands for. Last time we had the T5, Traversi 5 which means five overflow channels. Here, Traversi 3, three overflow channels, compared to the Primavera, which only had two. So, a little more power, and also very important, E for electronic. The electronic ignition was much more maintenance-free and reliable. After that, the handlebars become angular, so quite prominent, and as you already said, the cascade changes. It's no longer directly connected to the frame, it's made of plastic. Placed on the scooter here, there were different series of the special series. This special is now part of the first series with the parted lettering on it. In addition, here we have a German model with the indicators on the handlebars. There were also many other models with handlebar indicators. Still under the steering head with a lot small details, like this bell. This bell is often thrown away, but it's a very popular item among collectors. Is it valuable nowadays? It is. Okay. How do you recognize an original bell? You can recognize it by the label, and the real fans you can hear it by its sound. <laughs> this one looks very similar, so it's almost indistinguishable from the front. What's special about this model? This model worked. This one didn't really work, only for real enthusiasts or professionals. This is the Elistar, with small changes. Here you can still see the handlebar indicators. Here we have switched to the Italian model, without indicators. A little speciality. This scooter has on the other side, where the Vespa normally has its engine cover, another hatch. But it's not for luggage, but behind it, it's the starter. The ignition and the appropriate battery, which you can start the Vespa up here. But that's more theory. In practice, the battery was either always empty or never worked properly. Eric knows what he's talking about. Unfortunately, I do too. I had to repair things like this every now and then. And as you can see here, you step into nothing there. But they have an interesting detail, which also made the thing so vulnerable. Behind this side panel is a flywheel. It's quite thick, and that's because it's not just the ignition, and not just the flywheel for the ignition, it is also the starter. So an electric motor at the same time. The polarity is then somehow reversed, and this technology was just terribly vulnerable. Additionally, at 6 volts. Over here I think I have two 6 volt batteries, is that correct? That's right, yes. I remembered it correctly. Everything about that is just terrible. Okay, nice, rare, for a museum. What else do we have? I think there was another very nice version of the specials. A second official German version, which had four what looks like a small pocket TVs that was built in, right? That was the four indicator special. Quadruple indicator system, and it's just so beautiful that I didn't want to have it in my collection. Okay, what came after the special? After the special, there was a really huge step. We will then switch to the PK models. For me, they are still small frames and we're going to look at them now. 
good. But before we look at the piquets, I have to show you one more detail. I don't think I have seen that yet, at least consciously. This stainless steel sign here with this little lightning bolt, which I think is very beautiful. I also want something like that. All right, let's go to the piquets. Now, we have finally arrived in the 80s with the Vespa PK. A moment ago, we were at the Vespa Special, which is similar to the large frame old models, but also slightly edgy. Now, we have finally come to the edgy design of the 80s, the Vespa PK. Huge step for the Vespa, Vespa PK 50S, Vespa XL. There are various variants, 50cc, 80cc, 125cc, and it was always seen as kind of a rival to the PX series. Okay. So you can see that a lot has changed here, but the shape has also been changed a lot within the PK series. And I think we are now facing the most interesting model for collectors. I think so too. By far the rarest model of the PK series, the ETS. There were two different versions again, but I personally see that a bit like the Super Sprint of the 90s. So, you mean that it will reach the value of a Super Sprint? Today a huge underrated model, but it's so rare and it drives really well, it works and it is really something special. Okay. Again, if you've seen the large frame video, you might remember how Oli announced the ATS. The T5 is basically the large frame version. Here, we have the sporty scooter from the 80s as a small frame. It's not quite as fast as the large frame, but has a similar design with those stripes and with detailed changes to the engine and especially exhaust. It was a bit faster than the rest of the small frames, and right at the end of the PK series, a lot of plastic came into play. I don't want to say it nicely, but there is a political debate about the XL2. There is a lot of plastic built into it. Very futuristic. A good model to drive, but still difficult to collect nowadays. The model we are now having in front of us has run solid 6 kilometers, and I'm not quite sure whether the owner was just ashamed to drive it. Okay, hard judgment, but the XL2 also brought great benefits for small frame drivers. For example, the XL2 clutch. It fixed a lot of problems, but the look of the model was of course very controversial. The PK series had many other surprises in store for us, but we don't want to go into that in more detail now. Rather, we are sticking to the color, but we want to go back in time once more. There's dirt on my hands Strong like a tree There's roots where I stand Oh, I've been running from the law so. We're now standing in front of the hottest shit of the small frame world, the Super Sprint. We have two models, and why there are two models, and what the difference is, Eric will explain to us. That's erklärt uns Eric. Jesko, as I said, this is the holy grail of the Vespa. The Mercedes 300 SL among the Vespa models, the 50 and 90 SS. Down here is a 50cc APS and 90cc Super Sprint. Really just sold off the collector's item with the 90cc. Totally specific and not installed on any other models, the toolbox and the corresponding wheel cover with it. The model has also shortened and cut leg shield, so that it has less wind resistance, thus you can go faster, which is also very important for the racing series. And with the combination between the legs, the scooter can move even better around the corners, and you are even closer to the action. Of course you get the most powerful unit with the strongest small frame engine from that time. You had your options, otherwise you did not have a side pocket on the Vespa or any other way to store something. You only get a few more tools in here, but also having a box between your legs while driving. Not many have had the pleasure of being able to take a lap on a small frame with a box like this between their legs, but it's a little more fun than other models. But what you can store here is gasoline, to put it briefly. Tools belong in there, or whatever else comes to mind. 
What you miss on a Vespa in terms of driving technique is the knee closure, which you kind of get here using this toolbox, which makes it a little better in turns. Where there is certain racing series where these scooters drove. There were racing series, there was even a special group of drivers, the GPS, the Gruppo Piloti Speciali, who were even allowed to drive this model. It really is a selected group of those who get the opportunity to drive this model. Most of them were small, skinny Italians who sat in their scooters. Now, we as the middle of European standard being 190 tall would probably look quite funny and twisted on those scooters. I've lived in East Berlin for a long time and I always had to listen to the fact that apparently the Schwalbe is much faster than the 50cc Vespa. But now the Super Sprint came out in 1966. How fast was it? 75 kmh, if one person would ride it. This is compared to a 50N with 1.5 HP, super fast. Okay, 75 kilometers an hour. This is of course faster than any Schwalbe, in case someone would still ask you. How fast was the 90 SS? A lot faster than the 50 SS, because it has more power. But I rarely move them on the streets, because such rare pieces simply belong into a well-protected shell. Okay. And now the question that has been on my mind all the time since we've been standing here. You are so lucky to have your scooters inside your house. Why not in the living room? They're just red and white and not Verde Mela. I can understand that. And with that, let's go back to the studio. Crap. Thank <laughs> you.